Now that we added a basic Angular frontend and had a brief refresher on Angular, it's time to really make this a mean course and dive into at least the E and the N of mean. So that we covered A, E and N thus far, I guess. MongoDB will also be added soon. So the E and the N part, that's express and note. Node, as you probably know, and as I mentioned in the first course module, is a JavaScript runtime that runs on the server. So that means you can execute JavaScript code with some extra features and some missing features compared to the browser JavaScript version, but in general, still JavaScript, you can execute that on the server. You can create the server that listens to requests and sends back responses with it, and you can handle your server-side logic with it. And Express, as I also mentioned in the first course module, simply is a framework building up on Node. So you use it to make Node development easier, to get a couple of tools out of the box, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel for everything you want to add to your backend. In the big picture of our mean stack, the server side is on the right here on the slide. You see Node and Express are on the server side. We use the server for our core business logic especially the parts that are too performance intensive or security relevant and therefore shouldn't be run on the client, so in the browser. And Node Express is the important backend for our client side. The Angular app is about the user interface. Now, in order to do anything with the data the user enters and to persist it, for example, or do any transformations, calculations to add user authentication, for all this fun stuff, we need a server. So let's dive into creating our own server with Node.js. So being able to post new servers would be awesome. And for that, we wanna allow requests targeting slash posts, but these requests should now actually be post requests. Right now we're just using this middleware, which means all requests on our server or reaching our server will be handled by that middleware. Now we can narrow this down though. Instead of using app use, we can use app post. And this will now essentially attach a middleware, which works like here, but which only is triggered for incoming post requests. Respectively, we of course also got app get, app put, and so on. So now we can say, handle incoming requests, post requests, to slash API posts. And then we got our default function with request, response, and next. And in there, I wanna do something with that posted data. Now, we don't have a database yet, hence we can't store them for now. This is something we'll add soon though. For now, we can't store them, so we won't really be able to persist them. We won't be able to fetch them thereafter. But at least we can check if getting the data to that route works. So what we can do here is we can simply output the posts we receive with console log. The question just is, how do we get access to the posts sent with the request? Thus far, our request has always been an empty request. We didn't add any data because we only handled get requests thus far. Post requests have a request body though, so they have data attached to them and we need to extract that data. For that, we can install an extra package which adds a convenience middleware which we can plug into our Express app that will automatically extract incoming request data and add it as a new field to the request object on which we can then conveniently access it. To do that, make sure you can enter a command, for example by quitting the Angular server, and then run npm install dash dash save body dash parser. This is a node express package which can be used as a express middleware. Body parser does exactly what the name implies. It well parses incoming request bodies, extracts the request data because that will actually be a stream of data and converting it to just a data object we can use is something which is done by the package and it then re-adds it on a special property to that request object. So let's go back to our app.js file and in there, let's import this new package, body parser. You can name the constant however you want. And then we simply require body parser like this. Now we also need to use it, not just import it. 
and we do use it by adding it as an extra middleware, maybe in front of our course headers, but definitely in front of the post request, of course, where we want to use it. So there I will add it. Don't filter for a specific path. I want to do this for all incoming requests. And we don't use our cool function here. Instead, we simply pass body parser and then call the JSON method. And this will return a valid express middleware for parsing JSON data. By the way, even though we don't need it here, you can also use another feature of body parser in your apps, and that's the URL encoded function. This will also parse URL encoded data. There you need to pass some configuration, extend it, false to only support default features in URL encoding. Now that's just an extra line. We don't need it here. You could omit it. I just wanted to show you that body parser is capable of parsing different kinds of bodies. So now we're parsing that body. Now, of course, we want to use it here in the API posts post route. And there we can extract our posts by accessing request body. This is a new field added by body parser. Now, actually, this will just be one post though, not a list of posts. So this one post is now available here. We can now log it in console log, and we still need to return a response because it's still an endpoint for an incoming request. And to ensure that this request doesn't time out on the client, we need to return a response. So we also call res and then maybe set a status code with the status function of 201. That is a typical status code for everything is okay, a new resource was created, whilst 200 just means everything was okay. But here we also added a new resource. We didn't really, we didn't store it, but hey, we'll do this later. And then we call JSON to send back JSON data. Now, of course, we don't really need to send back data. You can send back a confirmation message though. So you could send back post added successfully or don't send back anything, uh, really just, well, what you need. That should also be successfully done there. So now we have this set up. Now let's try it out. And for that, we again need to connect Angular to this API endpoint. We added our post backend endpoint with the app post method. Now let's connect Angular. By the way, because I see it, we could also use app get down here. We can also stick to app use. The post request won't reach this because we don't call next here. And we absolutely shouldn't because we're already sending a response. We'll get an error if we still try to send another response. But we could call get here to really narrow this down to get requests. So that's a side note, but we want to go back to Angular. In post create component, we trigger that add post method. So it's in that method that we should send our request. So in add post, pushing it to our local posts is still fine because we still want to use our posts here probably. But I also want to store it on the server. So what I'll add here, and you could also add this at the very end. Uh, as a side note, what we're doing here basically is optimistic updating. We're updating the local data before we have server-side confirmation that it uh, succeeded. We could send our request here though, this HTTP post, because we'll send a post request. The URL will be the same one as for the get request, but with a different HTTP word. So like this, the post request here also gets back some data. So we can define this here with the generic type. We know we'll just get a message, which is of type string. And then we need to pass a second argument to that post method. And that is the data we want to post. And that of course is our, well, post data here. So this post constant. Now, as before, nothing will happen if we don't subscribe. So let's call subscribe here. And in that subscribe method, we got the typical handlers. Here, I will handle the success case and I will get back my response data. You can name this argument however you want. It will have this format. And I will simply console log response data message here. Now I said we used optimistic updating and we could move that to the end. But we can also switch from optimistic updating to only updating if we did succeed 
by cutting these two calls here and adding them in the subscribe method. Because this will execute asynchronously only once we got a success response, because this first argument is only called for success responses. So we will only push the new post to the local posts here if we really, well, have a successful response from our server side. With that, we can restart the ng-serve command or restart the local server. The node server should again have restarted automatically. And now let's see that in action. And we will see if it works by, well, seeing a log in our server-side log. So here where the node server is running and seeing a log in the browser because we're also logging here once we got a response. So let's go back to our application and reload it. And let's now simply try adding a new post here. Some cool content. Hit save post. And we get an error again. Another course error. Now what's wrong with that here? It's actually saying that the request header field content type, which is set automatically by Angular to application JSON, by the way, that this is not allowed. So if we go back to our express backend here, we did add it though, access control allow header, and that simply is a typo, it should be headers, sorry about that. So with that added, if we restart, we should be able to, re we don't even need to reload, but let's do it anyways, I guess. So let's try this again now. New post, something cool. And at least you could see that course thing in action, filtering not just for the domain, but also for the headers. And now if I hit this, the new post is added here, which is a good sign. We got post added successfully here, which means we got a success response from the server. And if we check our server side log, we also see the post object here. ID is null because we didn't set any on the client, but we see the title and we see the content. So this is now working as expected. We're posting data, we're getting data. Of course, one important thing is missing besides the ability to edit or delete posts. And that is, we're not storing the posts anywhere. We got no database. So time to add MongoDB in the next course section. Now, thus far, we always already started a server with ng-surf. And now to make it even more confusing, ng-surf behind the scenes actually uses a Node.js server. Really just because it's very simple to set up such a Node server. But ng-surf, and that is also important, only gives us a development server. Now, what does development server mean? It means it's a server aimed at Angular development. It's not a production ready server. And it certainly doesn't contain any of the logic we want to add to our server side. It also doesn't give us an entry point to add such logic. It's really just a server that returns the Angular app and that also has useful features like auto restart whenever we have a new Angular app version. So ng-surf is nice for developing our Angular application. It's not the server we will use as a backend. Because there's one important thing you have to understand regarding the way Angular and a node backend or any backend work together. We got two ways of connecting a node and Angular backend. The first approach we can take is that we have a node application, a node express application that serves the Angular single page application as part of it. It contains our other server side logic, but it also has a certain path, so a URL endpoint to which we can send a request where it will return that Angular single page application. The alternative is that we have two separated servers. So we have our Node Express server for our business logic, for the authentication, for the data storage. And then we have a separate static host, which only returns our Angular single page application. And in this course, we will actually see both approaches because they really only matter or differ when we reach the deployment section and the later sections of this course. I just want you to be aware of this. So in the first approach here, we have our Node Express backend, which handles incoming requests. And that's not just the request for the Angular app, 
but all the requests sent by the Angular app. Because as you saw in the big picture picture, Angular sends background HTTP requests to store data, to fetch data, and these requests need to be handled by the Node Express backend. So we have the endpoints for this, but additionally, we have one special endpoint, one special URL we're able to handle. And this is, for example, the slash path. So if we just send a request to our domain slash nothing, and you will see what I mean with that slash and with that path thing. But if we send such a simple request, then we return the Angular single page application for requests targeting any other path. We will do whatever our business logic is. Again, this will become more clear once we actually implement our paths. Now for the separated servers solution, we still have our Node Express app handling incoming requests because we have these background requests sent by Angular. But additionally, we also serve our Angular single page application from a totally separate static host. A static host is really just a simple server could be a node server, but could be any server, an Apache and Nginx server. So any server that doesn't run any server-side logic, any server-side code, but simply returns HTML, JavaScript, and CSS files. And that's all our Angular app consists of. So this is all we need. In both cases, we got logically separated apps though. So even if we use one and the same node server for serving both the Angular app and hosting our core business logic, well, in both cases, we actually have separated apps in a sense of Angular handles the UI and sends background requests and Node Express handles these background requests and does something with them. The only difference on the left approach where we also serve the SPA is that we got one special route, one special path where we do also return the Angular app. But that's all. Besides that, there is no strict connection. Because what we build is a RESTful API with our Node Express backend. Now, what is a RESTful API? So I mentioned in the last video that we're going to build a so-called RESTful API with Node.js. Now we haven't even had a look at Node.js yet, but this is important to understand because this is what we'll build in this course. What is a RESTful API? REST stands for Representational State Transfer. And what is it? Well, a RESTful API is, in the end, a server-side solution, a server-side service, so a server-side app, you could say. So we have the server and we have the client, the browser. Now in our case, Angular. The Angular app is going to run on the client. And this Angular app is going to send these background requests I was talking about. The server has to send back responses, which we can then use in the Angular app. Now often these responses are HTML pages, but that's only the case for traditional web apps where we don't have the support for background requests, but where we send back a new HTML page for every request. But this is not what we use in an Angular app. Instead, in an Angular app, a single page app, and not such a traditional web app, there we have our client, but we could also, and that's important, we could also have our clients, a mobile app, for example, and this mobile app could store and fetch data, but doesn't need or use render HTML. We could also have some other client, some service script we run on our machine, which also wants to access certain features which we expose on this API. But in our case, in this course, we simply have a client, which is a browser with a single page application. And there we want to store and fetch data, but never render a second HTML page because everything is re-rendered with JavaScript in that one page we have in that single page. So we get the right case here. I'm just showing these other cases because the important thing to understand is that a RESTful API is a stateless backend. It doesn't care about which client connected to it. All a RESTful API does is it exposes a couple of different URLs, so-called paths, to which you can send requests. And depending to which path you send a request, something different will happen. So to show this, we got a client, our Angular app, we got our RESTful server, and then we got different paths, slash users, slash posts, slash products. So you could send a request to your domain slash users, you could send a request to your domain.com slash posts, you could send a request to your domain.com products. 
And depending on to which path you send the request, something different will happen and you will get a different response. But this of course makes your API fully transparent and predictable and you can do different things with it. We create the API on our own, so we got full control what we want to support, what we want to offer. Now, besides these different paths, there's one other important thing we need for identifying or for handling a request correctly, and that is the HTTP verb used for that request. Get, post, delete, patch, put, these would be verbs you can use. And for the different paths, you might be supporting different verbs. You don't have to support all verbs for every path. For some paths, you only want to allow GET requests. For some paths, you maybe only want to allow POST requests. And with this, you can send such an AJAX request through Angular's HTTP client. For example, send a POST request to yourdomain.com slash users. And this would probably be adding a new user to your backend database. But what exactly happens is of course controlled with your server-side code that runs for this path. And in this module, you will learn how to create these paths and how to send requests to them. In the end, you will get back a response, which you can then use in your client-side application. That is how a RESTful API works. Now, we also need to care about the data we send. And there it's important to understand that we communicate with JSON data, not with HTML data, not with XML data. JSON is a data format which looks very much like JavaScript objects, which is very small but yet understandable and machine readable and which allows us to exchange data. We could use different data like XML, URL encoded data where we have everything added as query parameters in the URL, foreign data. These would all be alternatives, but in most of the cases and also in this course, we will use JSON data. So enough of the theory then, let's start building that node backend so that we can also see how that all works. So back in the project, to add this server, we could create a totally new project because I will start with this separated solution. I will not serve the Angular app through my node server simply because I want to keep on using this ng-serve command and this built-in development server the Angular CLI gives us. So we'll use ng-serve to serve the Angular app. We will build a totally separate backend for now. Therefore, we could do this in a brand new folder, in a brand new project. I'll do it in the same folder so that switching between the files is easier and easier to follow for you. I just want you to understand that all this node code is not actually related to our Angular code. That is why I'll also put it into a separate folder, by the way. I will add a brand new folder next to my source folder and I will name it backend. The name is totally up to you. Now for now, I won't add files, we'll do this later. What I want to do for now is create a single JavaScript file which will be our server because that's important about Node.js unlike for example PHP where you need a separate server software like Apache or Nginx. For Node.js, you create the server with Node.js too. So you write all that on your own. Therefore, I'll create a new file and I'll actually do this on the root folder so that it's a bit easier for us to execute. And that is the server.js file. So this is sitting directly in the root folder of our application. Now, this server.js file can now be executed with node.js. Now important, keep ng-serve running, but we don't need it for now. You could quit it, but keep it running so that we have it available later. And open a new terminal window. Here in my IDE, I can do this with this plus. In this terminal window, you can now execute that server.js file with the node command, which you should have available since you installed node.js on your machine. So you can run node server.js like this. Now, nothing will happen because it's an empty file. But what you can do is you can dump in a console log statement and say, hello. Now, this is of course no server-side code. It's not listening to any requests but we can actually execute any JavaScript file with Node, except for files that try to access something in the DOM because Node.js is a server-side runtime, there is no DOM. But this can be executed and you see hello here. Okay, so this is how this works. This is also how we will start our server later. So for now, let's turn this into a server. 
And to do this, we first of all need to import a package provided by Node.js, the HTTP package. Now in Angular, you always import it like this, import something from somewhere. Now this is not how we import in Node.js though. This syntax is not supported yet. It will be supported in the future, but even then in a different form, which isn't finalized yet. So we will use the default way of importing in Node.js. And that looks like this. You create a new variable, or since Node in the latest version, which we are using already supports ES6+, you create a constant because you don't plan on adding this, what we're going to add now. And that can be named however you want, but I'll name it HTTP because now I import with the require keyword. And then the package I want to import is the HTTP package. Now this is not a package we installed, it's not found in the package.json file, because this is a default Node.js package which was installed together with Node.js on your system. Require is the Node.js import syntax and this simply imports this package and stores its content in this HTTP constant. This is how we import in Node.js. With this imported, we can use the HTTP package to create a new server because the HTTP package has a create server method here. Now create server, as you can see if you hover over it in Visual Studio Code, takes a request listener as an argument. So a function it will execute for every incoming request, no matter which path this request targets. If it's targeting your domain or your IP, then this function here will be executed. I'll pass a ES6 arrow function here. So that's a normal function, just a bit more powerful than normal functions. And this function will receive two arguments, which will be passed in by Node.js, the request and the response object. These offer data and utility methods that allow us to work with requests and responses. Now in here, we can do whatever we want with the request. We can later, for example, parse it for the path that was targeted, though we will use Express to help us with that. Right now we're writing vanilla node code. More interesting is the response. The response has a couple of methods and one of them is the end method. This can be used to end writing to the response stream because you can actually write more. You can set headers there with set header and so on. So this can all be done, but here I will just end it and we can pass something to end like, this is my first response and then this will be sent as text. Now with that, we create a server, but it's not active yet. We need to store that server in a new constant because we'll not change this value. And thereafter we can call server listen. And to listen we need to pass a port number. Now this port during development will be 3000. So we can just set it like this. Though what I typically want to do here is I want to use that port or the default port of the hosting provider I'm hosting this at, because that hosting provider will normally give us that port number we wanna host our app at during production. So I will access a uh, environment variable with process.env.port, all capital case, or use 3000 if that's not set. Now environment variables are dynamically injected variables they're always accessed on process env, that's a Node.js feature. They can be injected by the runtime in which this app runs. And if it's not set, we will use 3000. So this is what will happen during development. Now with that, if we now execute our Node.js file again by running node server.js, you see it doesn't quit, right? It stays here, it doesn't jump back to allowing us to enter new text because this is now an ongoing process. We're listening for requests. If we now go to the browser, we can visit localhost 3000. And if we hit enter, we see, we zoom in, this my first response. Okay, this is no English because I forgot the is, but if I add it here and I reload, that's a good example actually. If I reload, nothing changes because that already is, uh, well, accidental, but your important takeaway, if you change something on your server-side code, you need to quit the running server with control C and restart it. Only then your code changes will take effect. So now if I reload, we see this is my first response.
So this is our first very simple Node.js server. This is how we add code and how we update the code. We need to restart. Now, writing all the code just with Node.js would be very cumbersome though. Because for example, if you wanna find out if we targeted just our slash nothing path or if we had our domain.com slash products, then we would have to parse that manually on the incoming request. The same is for the request body, the request HTTP verb. These are all things we don't wanna do. That is why we will add the express backend in the next lectures. Now that we worked on our code in the last lecture, let's now add express. So a framework for Node.js to make Node.js development easier. For this, I'll quit my Node.js server here and I will install express with npm by running npm install dash dash save to store an entry in the package.json file express. That is the name of the package, the express package. Let's hit enter. And this will now download express and add it to our project. Now I will add the express app and all the files that belong to it in the backend folder now. And we'll start real simple by adding a app.js file. Now this app.js file will hold the express app, which is still a Node.js server side app, just while well, taking advantage of these express features. To take advantage, we first of all need to import express and you know how that works. Feel free to do it on your own. We create a new constant, name it express for example, and then use require and then express. So the name of the package. This now is not a package shipping with node, but the package we just installed with npm. So now we got express installed. We wanna use express of course. And one way of using it is to, for example, quickly add one such route as it is called. So handling a request for a single special path only. We do this by first of all creating an express app. I'll name this app and store it as a constant because I won't change it. And then we just execute that express package basically or whatever we imported from there. We execute this as a function and it will return us an express app. This app can now be used and the important thing about an express app is it actually is just a big chain of middlewares we apply to the incoming requests. So like a funnel through which we send that express and every part of that funnel or in that funnel we have different parts and every part can do something with the request. Uh, manipulate it, read values from it or do something with the response like send a response. So we will add such a middleware here with app and then the use keyword. This simply, well, uses a new middleware on our app and on the incoming request. The middleware function, the use function here, in its simplest form takes a function which is executed for an incoming request. And that function takes three arguments, request and response, just like Node.js did, but also a next function. This next function has one important purpose. If you execute it in here like this, then the request will actually continue its journey. So if I copy this for example, and I add one other middleware after the first one, then we could console log something here like first middleware. And in the second middleware, we could do something with the response. So the first one of course is useless, just showing the middleware concept. So in that second, middleware, I'm not calling next, which means after this middleware, the request won't continue traveling down that file and reaching other middlewares. And the only thing I wanna do here to not let it go into the void and therefore time out is I will send back a response because the client which sent the request is of course waiting for such a response. We do that with the response object here, but this now actually is a different object than in Node.js, it's more powerful. For example, it has a send method. And this allows us to send back a response easily like hello from express. This will also implicitly end the response writing stream and will simply just, well, return that response and set the right headers, do everything for us. So it sends back this response for an incoming request. And the only thing we now need to do is we need to wire up this very simple express app with our server here, where we of course are listening to incoming requests. We wanna use that app as a listener, so to say. 
Now to export this app, we don't use the export keyword like this. Instead, just like imports that work a bit differently, exports work also different. We have a module object, which has an exports object, and we register what we want to export in this exports object as a value, so to say. So here I want to export the entire Express app, this one here. And this will not just export this constant, but also all the middlewares we attach to it. By the way, in case you're wondering, this is a constant because we never override the value stored in app. It's always this Express app. But we can then use this Express app to register new middlewares. This is not changing the value of this constant. This is why we can use a constant here. Then we're exporting the app. Now we just need to import it in server.js. And there I will add a new constant, app. The name is up to you. And I will require, and now it has to be a path to our app.js file. A relative path, so it's dot slash backend app, like this. Now I want to use that app as a listener for incoming requests. And all that has to be done for that is I pass it to create server. So there I simply pass app. Now one other thing is important. Before I do that, I will tell Express on which um, port we're working. So I will call app set to set a configuration for my Express environment. And I want to set the configuration for the port key, um, a reserved key Express knows basically. And there I will set this port. Now to not reuse the code, I'll simply add a new constant port here, store that code in there, and then use that port constant here, and also down there in the listener, which we still need to start. With that, I got my Express app set up and connected. And what we should see is that now if I restart my node server, we actually see hello from Express and this log here in this console log, if we go back to localhost 3000 and reload. And indeed, here we see hello from Express. And in the log, we see first middleware. And this proves, uh, well, the fact that both middleware is executed. And if you want, you can comment out this next call in the first middleware, restart the node server by quitting it and then rerunning it. That's important because we changed server side code. And then if I reload, well, we actually see it's loading infinitely here. It will actually time out after a few seconds or after a minute because we're not returning a response. We get first middleware here, but then it's stuck because we're not calling next. Hence, the request is not allowed to continue. It's not reaching this middleware, but we're also not sending a response here. And therefore, it will time out at some point of time. Now, I will simply quit the server to cancel this, but this is why it's important to call next if you're not sending a response. Now, with that, our Express app is added. Now let's do some refinements to our server before we actually start adding some logic which we can target from within our Angular app. Now we got the basic Node and Express app set up. It's not very powerful yet, but we'll get there. I want to improve the server.js file simply to add some error handling and better output. And attached to this video, you find a file with the content I'm about to paste in, and I'll replace the entire content in the server.js file with that uh, code. It's a bit more, but I will walk you through it. Now, I'm still importing app and my HTTP package, so make sure that path to your app file is correct. By the way, as you see and as you saw in the last lecture, you omit .js. And then I got this normalized port function, a bit of a more elaborate function that simply makes sure that when we try to set up a port, and especially when we receive it through an environment variable, we actually make sure it's a valid number if we want to use it. Then I got an on error function here, which will simply check which type of error occurred and, well, log something different and exit gracefully from our Node.js server. We got on listening, another function which is stored in this constant, an arrow function just like on error, where we essentially just output or where we log that we are now listening to incoming requests. Then here I'm setting up the port, calling that normalized port function from up there and then still accessing process and port or setting 3000 as a value. Here as a string, you could pass a number too, but I'm using a string here because the value we receive here typically would be a string. 
I'm setting this on my Express app. We set up that node server, and then I register two listeners, one for errors that might occur, where we will use the error handler here, and one for whenever we start listening, well, then I will simply a call on listening. And these are simply executed to tell us if something went wrong with starting a server or if everything went smooth. And then I do start the server. Now that's one improvement. And what we needed to do, if we hadn't quit the server already, we would need to quit and restart to see that in action. Now constantly being required to quit the server and restart it will become annoying. So I will install an extra package which we can use during development, which makes it a bit easier. So we'll use npm to install that package. npm install dash dash save dash dev actually because it's a development only dependency and it's called nodemon for node monitor. It's a powerful tool which simply watches our Node.js file or our JavaScript files in general. And if we change one of them, it will automatically restart the Node server for us. Now with it installed, we just have to use it to run our Node server. We won't use Node and then the server name anymore. Instead, it will be Node.mon. But since we haven't installed it globally on our machine, this command is actually not available. But it is available inside of this project scope. So what we can do is we can go to the package.json file and there we find a scripts section and we can just register a new script here like start colon server, the name is up to you. And then between the quotation marks on the right, you enter the command you wanna use and here you can use nodemon because it's a local dependency of this project and then server.js. And now we can run this script with npm run and then start server or whatever your name is. And this will now use nodemon to spin up that server and we get an error, but in general it's uh, working. And there's one thing missing in the attached file. Yes, sorry. You need to import one other package, debug, require the debug package and pass any identifier you want here, like node angular, that is up to you. Save this. And now we at least saw the restart in action. So now it started the server. This by the way is also a package shipping with node, so you don't need to install it. And now we got a setup where we can change our server side code. And for example, if I add an extra blank line here, and if we save, it will automatically restart the server. So with that, we got a nice development environment, a nice setup. Let's now finally make our app more useful and provide a route from which we can fetch some initial posts. Wouldn't that be great? So we want to be able to get posts, let's say. In our Angular app, we got the post list component. And there right now, we're getting posts here, but this is a useless operation because in our posts service, we start with no posts. And that is what we're fetching with get posts. Well, now I actually want to reach out to our node backend here and fetch posts, dummy posts for now because we have no database, but I wanna fetch posts from there. So let's go to our backend and we'll add all the other code now to our Express app because this is the tool we wanna use for creating routes. It makes it so much easier. And in there, we will now register a so-called path because I wanna fetch posts if we send a get request to slash path. Now to do that, I'll first of all get rid of that redundant middleware here. But then here on my app use middleware down there, I will add another argument. You can add a lot of or as many arguments as you want. The last one is your function which handles the request. The other arguments are filters or other middleware you apply. Like the first argument here I pass is the path for which I wanna filter down. So if I add slash posts here, it means only requests targeting localhost 3000 slash posts will reach this middleware. All other requests will actually go into the void because we have no default error handler right now. Now I will actually name this slash API posts, simply to make this really clear that this is a REST API, but this is optional. The important part is now we have to target this path to reach this code. And in here, I now want to return some JSON data. So instead of calling send like this, 
there actually is another method, the JSON method. And this will, well, return data in the JSON format. I'll set up my posts dummy data here, an array, a normal JavaScript array, and I will follow the format of posts in the front end, though with one extra field. In the front end, our posts right now have a title and content. Now I will also introduce an ID, because typically, if we had fetched these posts from a database, they would have an ID. Important for you to understand, the backend code and the structure of our data there is totally decoupled of the front end model we have here in the post model file. It can be the same, and in many cases, it probably will be the same, but you can also have data where you work with different fields and properties on the server than you do on the client. An example would be the user model. On the back end, you might store some extra information which you don't wanna pass on to the client, for example, because you don't need it there. Things like the hashed password. You don't typically send that back to the client because you don't need it there and it would even be suboptimal from a security perspective. Now for the post, as I said, a post here is not defined as a model because we're not using TypeScript here, as you can tell. Theoretically, it would be possible, but the de facto standard language for Node is sticking to vanilla JavaScript. So this is what we will do here too. And therefore, I will just create like this, add an ID, which is some random unique string, then add a title field where I say, first server side post, whoops, post, and add our content field where I say, this is coming from the server. Now I'll restructure this a bit to simply make this easier to read, put this into multiple lines. And one post is boring, let's add a second one. Let's roll our fingers over the keyboard again for the unique ID. And creative as I am, I'll name this second server side post and add an exclamation mark to the content. Now we got two dummy posts. Later, these will be coming from a database, of course. Now to return them here with our response, we could just send them like this. We could just pass them to JSON. An array is a valid object. We could turn it into JSON. But we could also send back a more complex object where we maybe have a message like posts fetched successfully. And this really depends on how you want to structure your API and which data you want to use on the client. Here I just want to demonstrate that you can send more complex objects too. So here I have my message property and then my posts property, which actually holds the posts array. Now we're sending this object as JSON. Now one little extra piece of information I want to add to the response by chaining another method prior to JSON is I will set a status code with the status method and here I will set it to 200 for success. Now you don't need to return the response because it's the last statement in this use function anyways, so it will return. You shouldn't call next because there is no next middle where we want to execute. We really want to finish with sending that response and therefore we're all set to try this out. Now let's save this and the server should restart automatically. And let's try it in the browser first by copying that path, going to the browser and adding localhost 3000 and then this copied path. And you should see your JSON data as text here. Now it's cool, we can read this as humans too, but of course it's also highly machine readable. And that is what we'll now take advantage of by connecting our Angular app to it by using the Angular HTTP client. So back to Angular, let's connect Angular and fetch the posts from there. And I wanna do that in the posts service here in get posts. In get posts, I wanna reach out to my backend, fetch the posts, store them in posts here, and then fire my update listener to inform everyone interested in my app, for now the post list component, that we got new posts. So I kick this off in post list component and I handle the response, but actually in two separate parts, which makes sense because fetching the posts is an asynchronous task. It will take a couple of seconds or milliseconds. So in get post, I wanna send an HTTP request and sending HTTP requests, thankfully is very easy with Angular because it has a built-in HTTP client. To use that client, we need to unlock it first and we do unlock things in the app module. 
There, we need to import something from the Angular package. I'll import my HTTP client from at Angular common HTTP. That is the package path you want to use. Now, actually, we have to import the HTTP client module here, excuse me. So with the HTTP client module imported in the app module, we have to add it to the imports array to really unlock this feature. And now we can use that HTTP client in our components or services. And yes, we could use it directly here in that component, but I want to centralize this task in my service. It's not directly related to the template or to the UI of that specific component. We maybe want to use it in other parts of the app too. So centralizing such HTTP calls in services makes a lot of sense. Now to use this in this post service, we need to inject the Angular HTTP client into the service. And that's important to know, you can inject things into services too, not just in components. And you inject by using the constructor here too, because it is a normal class after all. And we want to inject that HTTP client, so we need to import it first. So let's add an import statement and import HTTP client from at angular common HTTP, like this. Now we're importing that. Now we can inject it and I will already and automatically bind it to a private property by adding the private keyword. I'll name it HTTP, but you could name it HTTP client, whatever you want. Important is the type. This allows Angular to find out what we want as an argument here. And the type is the HTTP client we just imported. Now we can use it in get posts and I will remove the return statement for now. Here I will use this local HTTP property, this HTTP, and as you can see, we got a couple of methods there for sending a GET request, a POST request. Now here, we want to use a GET request. By the way, on our Express backend, we haven't specified that we only handle GET requests here. This is something we'll add later. But a GET request does reach this route, as we could verify in the browser, because we send GET requests by default if we enter a URL there. And therefore, let's send a GET request from the Angular app too, with the GET method. Now, this get method expects a path to our backend, to our server. So here we simply enter HTTP slash localhost 3000, and I will show you how to easily replace this with a more dynamic solution later in the course, slash API slash posts. So exactly the path we're targeting here in the browser. You can, of course, also copy it from there and simply enter it here. Now, this alone won't do anything, though. The Angular HTTP client uses observables. You remember, you learned about them in the last course module. And it especially uses an observable, which won't do anything, and it won't even send the request which it wraps, if you don't listen to it. Because if you're not interested in the response, why would it send the request? Now, to listen, you need to, well, subscribe. And now here's one other piece of information. You don't need to store that subscription and unsubscribe from it in ng on destroy. This would be available on services too, by the way. But you don't need to do that because for observables connected to features built into Angular, like the HTTP client, this unsubscription will be handled for you by Angular. So here we subscribe. And we can pass three arguments here. The first one for new data, the second one for errors, and the third one when it completes. Now, we're interested in new data, which will be the response. And we probably also want to add error handling, though we will do that later in the course. For now, let's focus on the positive case. Let's add a function that gets executed whenever we got a response. And in this function, we will actually get back the body of this response already. The Angular HTTP client will give us access to this body immediately. If you want a different behavior, you can change this and you can learn more about the in-depth features of that HTTP client in my complete guide, for example. Now the get request or the get method here is a generic method actually, and we can clearly specify which type of value we will get back. For example, an post array, though that would be wrong, because if you take a closer look at your backend, the body of the response will be this object. 
So actually, we will get back an object which has a message property which is of type string and which has a posts property which is of type posts array. But we can specify that here too. We'll get back an object with a message property that has a string value and a posts property that is a list of posts. Just one important addition. The posts definition, the model changed a bit. On the back end, our posts also have an ID. So maybe we should also add this to our front end model. There, I now add an ID field like that. Uh, this means that when we're creating a new post down there, we're missing this. I'll simply fix this by setting ID null there. Because we have no ID, it wasn't generated on the server yet. I will therefore just add an empty ID. But we'll come back to posting posts to the server later, back to getting posts. Now we defined which format our data will have. And this helps us because now here, where we get our post data, we actually get TypeScript support and IDE support. And for example, my IDE knows that we have a message and a post property on the response data. I'm interested in the posts and I actually want to store them in my posts variable here. So we can say this posts equal to the posts we're fetching from the post data. No need to duplicate this, by the way. It's coming from the server. We can't accidentally change it on the server. There is no such connection. It was part of a HTTP response. So now we're setting the posts to the posts coming from the server. We can do this because we know that they will have the exact same format and structure. Now, if you're wondering what happens with the JSON thing, uh, it was JSON format. Don't we need to change that back to JavaScript? Well, this is done for us by the get method already. So it extracts and formats the data. And we can now just assign it like this. Now there's one other thing we need to do. We need to inform our app and the other parts of our app about this update. So I will call this posts updated next. And here I will pass a copy of this posts for the same reasons as before, so that we can't edit our posts in the service. Now we should have an app that actually works. The one problem we have is that we see it down there. Get posts now doesn't return anything, but in the past in post list, we actually expected to get back posts. Well, we can simply change this now. We weren't getting back posts anyways, and now we simply just trigger that HTTP request whenever post list component is loaded. And that of course means that for now we can only fetch new posts if we reload the page, but we'll also change this later. But we'll trigger this HTTP request. And since we have the subscription, we should also be able to render the posts once they're there. So now let's save this again and recompile. And now let's try this out by visiting our Angular app again. So now not localhost 3000, but localhost 4200. Here, we don't actually see anything. Now, this actually is related to an error we can see if we open the developer tools. No access control allow origin header is present on the requested resource. Now, what's that all about? In the last lecture, we encountered the so-called course error. Course stands for cross origin resource sharing. And that's exactly what we're doing. We have a separated server and client. Remember, they're running on different domains, localhost 3000 for the server, localhost 4200 for our Angular app. Now, client and server want to talk to each other and they're not on the same host. If they were, then we could communicate without any issues. But if they're on different hosts, like in our case, we got 4200, but it doesn't matter if we have different hosts, well, then communicating with such background requests will fail. And that's a security mechanism. You should not be able to access the data on a server or its resources in general if you're not running on the same server. So if the request is coming from a different address, this will give us a so-called course error. The problem just is for our setup and for many modern web apps, we want to allow this. It's not a security issue here. It's a wanted behavior. We want to expose our server API to all possible clients and naturally they will not run on our server. So we need to disable this default mechanism and this is done by setting the right headers on the server side response. Now which headers are these? Back in our code, it has to be done in the server side code as I mentioned. So let's go there to the app.js file. 
And there I will simply add one additional middleware. Now this middleware of course has to run before we handle the response sending here because thereafter the response is already sent, we can't manipulate it anymore. And we want to manipulate the response because we need to add headers to it. So app use, no filters added, so no path filters added because I want to do this for all incoming requests. And then I get my default function as an argument here, which gets the request, the response, and this next function it can call. And in there, the goal is to call next at the end, because the request should be able to continue to the next middleware. But before we do that, I want to manipulate the request, or the response to be precise. So we'll take the response object and set a header with the setHeader method. Now the setHeader method is very simple. The first argument is the header key, the identifier, and the second one is the value for that header. So I want to set a header which is called access-control-allow-origin. And make sure to not mistype here, because this is a clearly defined header understood by the browser. The value I want to set it to is a star. This means no matter which domain the app which is sending the request is running on, it's allowed to access our resources. This is one important header, it's not the only one though. We also need to set another header related to this. It's the access control allow headers header. Well, the first one allows which domains are able to access our resources, but now we can also restrict this to domains sending requests with a certain set of headers besides the default headers. There are default headers like the browser and so on, but we also want to allow some extra headers. We want to allow the origin header, and that simply is a comma separated list here, the x requested with header, the content type header, and the accept header. You can add more, you can also remove some of them, we don't use them all in this app, but this essentially means the incoming request may have these extra headers. It doesn't have to have them, but it may have them and it will still be allowed. If it has another non-default header, which is not defined here, access would be blocked, even though we do generally allow it for all domains, but this is an additional criterion. Now there's one other header I will set with set header, and that is the access control allow methods header. And here we control which HTTP verbs may be used to send requests. And I want to allow get, post, and as you can see, this is again a comma separated list, patch, delete, and important, options. This is an implicit request sent by the browser by default prior to post requests, for example, to check whether the post request is valid. So even if you never directly send such an options request from within your Angular app, it will implicitly be sent and therefore you should allow it as a HTTP verb. Now you can also allow put for example if your app needs that. If you don't plan on using it, don't add it. So this is now our setup and with these headers, we should now be able to send that request. So if we save that, it should restart the server automatically. We can go back to our Angular app and simply reload the page. And now we see our two posts here and we got no error. These are the posts coming from the server and this is how we connect our Angular app to our Node Express server in the most basic form. Now that's cool and all, now let's also make sure we can post new posts to the server.